I have never felt comfortable with my own sexuality. It was always the strange thing that I wanted so very to explore. Because in order for you to really understand yourself, you have to be able to experience the touch of another person. One time a girl who was a friend of mine gave me an a feel that changed how I saw my own sexuality. It was the first time that I felt attractive, but I still had questions. I decided to find out why it is perceived to be the last taboo. I have some problems which basically means that I don't have total control over my muscles. But I mean, everything still works down there. I have arthrogryposis, which is um, amyoplasia, which is the, that's the specific form of it. And it's um, a congenital orthopedic condition that um, mostly affects muscle growth and also joint, joint flexibility and atrophy. My disability is mild cerebral palsy, and then secondary is chronic pain. And then I was born with lumbar sacroiliac genesis which means that my, uh, I was born without my last five vertebrae. So like from my hips to my ribs, there's no bones, so I can do this <laughs> without my ass leaving the seat. That's stretch. Um, my disability is called arthrogryposis. Um, it affects about one in 3,000 people, um, and it's, it's, you're born with it. So basically it's um, a joint condition so all my joints and ligaments are really tight. And my muscles are weak and underdeveloped. Um, my bones are, um, you know, slightly um, weak. Um, so what you get is a lot of contractures. So for instance, my jaw is actually contracted, so I can't open my mouth very wide. Um, my hips are both dislocated. Um, all of my joints are all kinds of messed up. So I talk about people with disabilities as experts. I'm really good at living with my disability. I know exactly what it is, I know exactly what it means, and I know exactly how I adapt to it for what I do in the world. So that makes me an expert. I'm not unable. I'm actually very able in the context of being somebody who happens to not be able to walk because of the injury that I had 37 years ago. My first word was squirrel. I think my next word was mom, and my word after that was disability. It was a word that I needed to be able to articulate something that was going on with my body. It's, it's, it just means limited ability. Like, my, my physical ability is limited in specific ways. I think that's the reason why I personally don't actually like the word disability to describe what's going on with me, because it's not, to me, it's not specific enough, I guess, because it just sounds like, my ability is dissed. Like, <laughs> I guess when someone asks, you know, what what's your definition of disability? Uh, my thought is it has to do with you know your body or your mind or what have you, you know, acting in a so somewhat you know different way than you know is our society standard. So you just go about things a little bit differently. 
The problem with the word disability is that it, it's, it has a negative connotation from the get-go. It automatically implies that there's something that somebody can't or something that somebody isn't. And that becomes defining a foundational definition of the way somebody thinks of somebody. And then it spills over into everything, including sexuality. I think one of the things that defines beauty in, in general to people tends to be a little normative. So people will look at something and they think it's beautiful if it falls under certain guidelines and they've really strictly defined that. And I think that is definitely what puts so much stigma on the idea of someone with a disability being a sexual person um, because people can't quite connect the dots between the idea that someone has a non-normative body um, or presentation and the fact that they might be sexual. And I think the same runs true for people who are really overweight or you know, just you know, look in some way different from that idealized, commercialized view of what attractive people are. I walked up until I was 17. The only two things I couldn't do was ice skate or ride a bike. Um, at 17, a bunch of surgery was done to um, make me normal. I, I don't really know. It was still my legs would be straight and I would walk better and all that stuff. And it literally, like, they cut everything from the hips down with, like, bone cutters. Like, it wasn't pretty. And 17, because I was almost, actually, I was, like, almost 18 when this happened. That's a really crucial time. I would think. And like, so meanwhile, I had no clue about my body anymore. It was like, someone just took off my legs and put someone else's legs on. Like, I had no idea how I, anything really. And it really screwed with my sense of sexuality and beauty, like you said earlier. Because, and identity, yeah. And identity, because I lost everything. Like, anything I thought I was completely got shattered. Not knowing, you know, and being so poked and prodded. And mm -hmm. when you would, when I would bring up stuff to the doctor, who was male, always a male, like, well, what about sex and what about babies and why are you thinking like that? That's never gonna happen for you. Like that's that's not even like on his radar. And I'm like, but I'm 18, and at some point I thought I wanted family and you know, but so a lot of that is not addressed medically at all. So that kind of screwed me up for a while, mm -hmm. uh, mentally as far as beauty, because I kind of got it twisted in my head like, well. It's just flesh, like it means nothing, and there's no, it's just flesh, so why treat it nice? One of my first opinions of myself as a person with a disability who was sexual or who hoped to be sexual one day was that I, um, was that no one was going to find me sexually attractive. Like, that was, like, a really big thing. So, like, holding myself to this really specific almost like scary standard um like needing to be um like you know like as groomed and as femi and as like you know presentable as possible because for me it was less forgivable to not look good you know because my disability and you know whatever else I thought was weird about my body um being one of the only black kids in my school, like all this different stuff, was like ways that I was like, all right, well, I have to make up for it, you know? And I think that what I didn't realize is that it's not, it's not all about people finding you like sexually attractive. Like I was like, oh, once I realized that people did find me attractive, I thought that my world would open up and it would be great and everything would be awesome once people thought I was hot. And then I realized that like, People can think you are hot and still objectify you and not think of you as a person and not actually really want to be in a relationship with you and not take you home to mom and dad and like not see you as a real like relationship potential at all. So I started this like once I realized that I could fuck people, I started this mantra of like, but I'm not girlfriend potential. So beauty for me is more like something that catches my eye or makes me feel something or makes me think of a certain differently than I would. Something that makes me think is beautiful because I'm thinking outside the box or seeing something different than what it is. I identify as pansexual, um, which most people um, don't really 
know about it, haven't really heard of it. Um, basically, pan um, is a prefix that essentially means all-encompassing. Um, and so pansexual kind of refers to someone who is attracted to pretty much anybody. So for me, um, I don't define myself as bisexual because I'm not just um, attracted to a cisgendered female and cisgendered males. Um, I'm attracted to uh, people of all different genders, um, including um, transgendered individuals, uh, androgynous individuals, gender queer, gender fucked, um, everybody. <laughs> so for me, it doesn't really matter what's between the legs so much as it matters what's between the ears. So much of what people want to believe about boys, you know, is that uh, is that we are strong in a really specific kind of way, is that we can provide, is that we can take care of people, is that we can lift heavy boxes and mow the lawn. I guess it's been, um, I don't know, just like interesting being able to like think of myself as a boy who is abject from that, as a boy who is definitely not inside of this like prescribed idea of like what a boy should be, not only because I look like a girl in certain ways or am perceived as a girl, but also because even if I take testosterone, even if I, you know, like do all of these like medical things that are going to change my appearance in really intense ways, even if I do those things, I'm still going to be disabled. You know, I'm still going to be a physically disabled boy. I'm still not going to be able to like, you know, um, always top someone in bed or like pick them up and throw them over my shoulder and carry them away to my cave. You know, like those are not things that like I'm going to be able to do. So me interacting with someone sexually as, um, you know, as a certain kind of male person still needs to acknowledge my disability. And I think that there are really interesting ways that people conceptualize disability as feminizing you and also infantilizing you. I remember that night very clearly. Our bodies were up against each other and it just it felt great, you know, um because that all we were just to bodies connecting in that single moment. In 1973, I was 18 years old, and I fell out of a tree from 25 feet up and broke two vertebrae in my spine, and it compressed my spinal cord. And with a spinal cord injury, the brain can't communicate below the level of that injury to the cord. But my level of injury is pretty low, which is why I have full use of my arms and my upper body and my hips. So that's the way my body is working. I'm not actually paralyzed from the waist down, I'm paralyzed from the thighs down. So it's different for each person. So after my injury, I had surgery to repair my spine and uh, a stay in the hospital. And then I did seven weeks of rehabilitation. And that was a really important part of this whole experience because they taught me how to live with my paralysis. They taught me wheelchair skills, they taught me how to dress myself. They taught me things about the way I needed to take care of my body and deal with changes in my body. And they made me strong. After seven weeks in the rehabilitation hospital, I went home. And that was my first experience of starting to be out in public and sense how people were reacting to me, but also how I was feeling about the way people were reacting to me. And that was, that was the bigger part. I wanted credit for having been a walking person. At first, it was an adjustment process of integrating my own sense of myself as a person with a disability. Because my point of reference was still, I was a walking person. You know, I, I'm one of you, everybody. This isn't actually who I really am. I think that people in general, um, this can't be said for everybody, but I think people in general associate disabilities with um, 
not only a physical involvement, but a mental involvement in a lot of cases. For example, um, you know, I, we have a friend, we have several friends um, with CP, and when they talk, I do see people in public who almost immediately get an expression on their face that to me reads, I think that your mental faculties are not what mine are. You know, we're seen as having so many issues and we have to pity, be pitied and, you know, my legs don't work. Why would I think about sex? Which is just, so for me, like, it's so disconnected. But for an able-bodied person who doesn't either experience disability or doesn't, you know, interact with people who experience disability, you know, that's, like, it makes sense to them if your body doesn't work the way theirs does, then you must not be interested in sex. Like, I don't, I don't get it because I'm on the other side of that. I, I, I do think there's pressure to not view people with disabilities as sexual. Uh, I remember going to a concert with my little brother. And my little brother, we're like, he is as gung-ho about disability rights and equality as, you know, anyone I've ever met in a chair, even though he's, you know, able-bodied. Because he grew up with me and seeing, like, how I got around, and that's, that's normal to him, you know? And the idea that other people would, like, want me to, you know, wouldn't care about me doing stuff was just so foreign to him. And we went and saw this concert, and he brought one of his friends along, and I drove to both of them. And sitting in front of us was a girl I played basketball with, who I hadn't seen for, in ages and all that kind of stuff. And then once I dropped uh, my brother's friend off at home, he said it was funny seeing a, Amanda there. And David's like, yeah, man, she got hot. <laughs> so I was like, oh, really? You know, yeah, what Mike say? He's like, dude, I didn't tell, say that to Mike. The most regular time you, you do see disability or people with disabilities in a sexual way, it's always like this, like, you know, this uh, fetishization. There are people who are turned on by disability. And they're called devotees. There are couples in the world where one person actually is stimulated by the disability of the other person, and they're completely honest and open and completely understand it and nobody's being forced to do, it, do anything and it works for them but like any sexuality it's that communication and honesty that counts and what happens with devotees is that it can be very unhealthy it could be very dangerous because some of those people they actually want to cast that person with a disability in a certain role so people with disabilities have got to be careful of this they have got to be a little more discerning about the people that they're with and why that person might be choosing to be with them and to be able to say, no, I'm out of here, if they sense that that's what's going on. It's another unfortunate social stereotype that, oh, somebody with a disability has got somebody who's willing to have sex with them, so you better stick around and put up with anything because you might not find another partner, right? Which is really an insulting way to think about people with disabilities, as it is for anybody. I, I think... When it comes to sexuality and, you know, what your aid helps with and what your aid doesn't help with, it really depends on the person and their disability. Um, you know, I have friends with cerebral palsy and, and other dis disabilities who, you know, cannot help themselves um, to masturbate. And, you know, if, if that was something that was comfortable between the client and the aid, then I would not judge it. Um, for me, the only times I've been sexually involved with any of my aides was when they were actually partners prior to becoming my aide. You know, there has to be a very distinct, like, when you're here to aid, you are here, it is a job, I reserve the right outside of our relationship to redirect or, you know, um, fire if need be, you know, make adjustments, ask you to redo something, you know as I would basically your employer. Um, however, then when that, those hours of aiding are over, then those hours of aiding are over. I, 
I have no experience with animal kissing or stuff like that. So she kind of leaned over and um um put a tongue in the mouth and um I was like, whoa <laughs> this is pretty weird. <laughs> I can't like it. People are scared. Um, they don't know what they're dealing with and what people don't understand. I mean, it's an old, old adage, but it's true. What people don't know scares them, and um, they're not sure how it's going to work. You know, you know, do you have feeling there? You know, what does your disability mean t to to how we can be involved sexually and you know, is it just going to be really horrifyingly awkward? Am I going to feel guilty? And, and all of these things, it, people, unfortunately, a lot of people um, are not only scared, but sometimes selfish in the sense that they think, I don't want to deal with it. They don't see um, people with disabilities as potentials for long-term partners. Um, and they certainly don't see, I think, people with disabilities as potentials for flings or, you know, you know, you know, affairs or things like that because they think, you know, this should be easy. You know, if, if I'm going to have a one night stand with somebody, I'm going to have a one night stand with them and then walk away and not, not have to feel like responsible or guilty or et cetera. And um, I think that the idea of adding a disability to that makes people feel guilty. And that's one of the things in society that just needs to change. My first introductions to sexuality didn't really have a lot of room for dialogue or a lot of room for consensuality or a lot of room for like body positivity, like any of that stuff. You know, it was really a lot to do with like, okay, so, you know, if you're, if you're cute enough for me to sleep with you, we'll do that thing. But I, you know, didn't feel the room to be able to be like, well, my body can do this thing, but it can't do this thing, you know, or like that hurts or like this doesn't feel good, but this feels good, which are all things that I definitely care about being able to communicate now. I met him once he was in middle school and I was um, in high school and he and a group of his friends stopped me walking down the street and surrounded me and um, asked me if I was a lesbian because I had a rainbow button on my purse and I told him I wasn't and they all like, you know, surrounded me and started grabbing at me and one of them jumped onto the back of my wheelchair and like grabbed my chest and like held on really tight and like we're like, do you like that? Do you like that? You know, you're a lesbian. Do you like that? And I remember being like, okay, this is not gonna happen right now. And as much as I was like scared in that moment, I was like, this is not gonna happen. And I turned my wheelchair on, I was in my motorized wheelchair, and I said, you're gonna need to get off now. And I turned my speed up all the way, and I just started driving as fast as I could with this kid on my fucking back, holding on to my fucking boobs, like, no, 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 I'm like, oh, you can't talk as good, good now that I'm driving, can you? And then there was, we got to the end of the road, and there was like a huge step, like probably this tall. And my chair just like caught air, and this kid, fell off the back and then I went back around and he was still on the sidewalk and I went back up the curb cut and came back and just ran over his feet and legs a few times um, while he screamed and then I got a coffee. For the first time I really felt like someone really wanted me in, the, in that way. So the feeling that I wasn't going to be considered as a sexual partner was a tough thing to face. The sense that 
women were looking at me and not, not, not reacting to me in that way as a possible partner. And I was struggling with this anyway, before my injury. One time I went out with some friends in New York, and Ellie, our friend Ellie, came along too. And Ellie's able-bodied. Okay. And then it was myself, um, Pete, who uses a chair, and Wally, who's blind. And everyone was talking to Ellie about how great she was for bringing us out that night. Oh, all right. Well, that's... that's... And I was like, hey, I'm the one that drove and paid her a cover, all right? Like, <laughs> what the hell? And everyone was like, wow, it's so nice of you. And then, like, then they continued to hit on her <laughs> as if she didn't come here with three guys. And so, like, these cisgendered boys, you know, who were often able-bodied, who were often able to carry me up and down stairs and stuff, you know, if I didn't want to be with them necessarily, if I didn't want to be sexual with them, what would that mean, you know, for my future of partnerships? Like, is it possible for me to try to take on a different sort of sexual role as a disabled person when so much of my relationships to people has had to do with dependence. So this girl over here um, and I were together for three and a half years. Um, and I'm gonna, I guess I'll tell the story of basically the point at which we decided we were no longer just friends and we were going to be in a quote unquote relationship. Um, well, in our relationship, um, when I first got involved with Lauren, um, we had actually not been talking for some time. I was going through something very personal at the time involving my gender identity and my orientation, um, and she had approached me about it and offered a lot of support and openness, um, which was something that a lot of other people weren't willing to do at the time. Then a mutual friend who happened to be my roommate um, actually came to me and said, yeah, so Aaron is no longer Aaron. Aaron is he. Aaron is now Shay. And so I was like, hmm, that seems like a difficult road to go alone. That's cool, though. So I sent Aaron a message on Facebook, and I said, yo. Actually, I sent Shay a message. And I said, what up? And despite our past, you know, it sounds like you're going through some tough things. I just want to let you know, like, if you need somebody to talk to or whatever, I'm here. Um, Shay responded, and basically we, you know, went out for coffee or something like that, some cliche thing. Started talking, then somehow Shay became my aide, and we were talking more. We were working closely together and had to stay somewhere overnight. <laughs> And there was one bed in the hotel room, which was terrifyingly awkward. So, you know, we're laying down, going to bed. Shay turns to me, says, have you ever been kissed? I was like, no. Shay says, oh. And then he kisses me. I had kind of wanted to broach the subject of potentially being involved in some way in a relationship with her anyway, so um, I cheated and used the fact that there was only one bed um, to kind of, you know, um, be all snuggly and stuff. I knew that the world didn't view me as a viable option for a real relationship, and, you know, I've been crushing on this guy and uh you know it was like just hoping that something would happen and I didn't know I didn't have the confidence to try to make anything happen and then you know it happened and you know it was dorky and cute and cliche and wonderful all at the same time and it was perfect and you know like the next week you moved in <laughs> um you know, and, and then eventually, somehow we got back around to Aaron. And, uh, you know, that was kind of, I think, both of our favorite stories. <laughs> Certainly a defining story.
it's not hard. My first serious relationship was with Matthew, and we met playing wheelchair basketball for the city of Philadelphia. Um, there was only two teams in the area, one in North Jersey and one in Philly. We just met playing basketball at 17. It was the first time we actually had sex. <laughs> Lasted very quickly. <laughs> Not for the <laughs> usual reasons, though. <laughs> I don't know you that, yeah. <laughs> Not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were just doing the usual. <laughs> messing around the floor. Uh, and you, like, I was on my back, and then you... Hopped on, <laughs> slid in, and you're, and then you had to hop. You hopped off in like what, ten seconds or so? A little bit longer than that. <laughs> At least two minutes. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was stuck. I couldn't get back. All of a sudden, I was trying to get out. Get off. Yeah. <laughs> See what was that? Okay. Yeah. So like two minutes, and uh. <laughs> he fell asleep <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well that was that was it. That was sex. That's what everybody talks about for like ever, and that was it. Wow. I was misled. <laughs> yeah, by the end of the week we were like, alright, let's have sex two, three, four times a day. We're good. It's like it was crazy. It was like first time, end of the week is like, huh, I need to buy stock and Dorex. <laughs> I think that queer sex, being able to have queer sex and opening myself up to queer sex and feeling good about it has been a lot about what has taught me about how to have sex both with a different body and with different bodies because you already are thinking about new ways that you do things. You're already thinking outside of this like normative paradigm of like missionary position, this is how people have sex, you know? Rain lived in the dorms um, my second year at Hampshire. She was the first year. I remember the first time, the first time that um, we ever, like, spent the night together. It was really, really lovely. And the whole night, like, we didn't, we didn't have, like, like, sex at all. It was really just, like, about breath and about skin and about fingernails and biting and like exploring differences between convex and concave like moving with each other and it was so cool because the whole time she kept saying is this okay is this okay is this okay and I was like what are you doing where I come from people don't talk during sex <laughs> I was like, why do you keep asking me if it's okay? Of course it's okay. I'm making good sounds. Um, but but it was awesome. It was really good. And that was like one of my first introductions to like what consensual intimacy could be. You know, a lot of times you had to look at things and think very hard about whether it was going to work ahead of time or at least be willing to finagle once you were there. Um, to make it work by adjusting things a lot before you could really get going. And especially if you're dealing with somebody who has chronic pain or a lot of pain. Um, I think a lot of people have this weird assumption that, or maybe it's not weird, but I just think it is because I'm used to it, um, that they're gonna break you. You know, if you have a disability and I'm rough with you, I'm gonna hurt you really badly. And so they, they're not willing to kind of be a little rough. And especially if your partner likes those things, um, there is definitely some hesitancy. So, you know, you kind of have to learn what that person's boundaries are, what is painful to them specifically and what's not. So we did a lot of that as well, you know, where I had to make adjustments for things that wouldn't hurt me at all, but hurt her. So every person's disability has a different kind of impact on their sexuality and spinal cord injury has a very specific effect on the nervous system and what is possible for somebody to feel or how their body functions. 
So for me, I was injured in the part of the spinal cord which is exactly right in the area where sexual innervation takes place. And so for me, I lost sensation on the surface of my penis. I have internal sensation, but the surface I have very, very little. And it stops right at the base of my groin. So it's sort of a cruel design of God's that the, that part of the spinal cord, injury, uh, spinal cord and, and nerves happen to be built in the way where that's right where it stops. Um, and also my ability to ejaculate was affected by this. But I had to find out for myself what all of this meant. The first thing I was concerned about was what can I do and will I be able to enjoy the experience. I already knew I was a great kisser, so I had that to go on. Yeah. You know, that nothing was going to affect that. And I knew that my partners that I made out with, you know, enjoyed it. But I was becoming an adult, so I needed to explore more. And that was scary for me. I didn't know how that was going to happen. Um, and I couldn't do a great deal to satisfy myself because of the way my body is wired now, that all that rehearsing that I did for all those years preparing for intercourse really wasn't the same kind of option, wasn't really a source of a lot of enjoyment for me anymore. I really needed somebody to explore my, my sexuality with me. It took a couple of years until I connected with somebody who I had known, a girl that I had known in high school, and hadn't seen her in a long time. We were never friends or really attracted, but we saw each other at a friend's wedding mutual friend's wedding and something did connect and we started spending some time together and we kissed and the thing happened which is what has to happen chemistry for me um being on like being on all fours works really well i really like that um i've always been really good at crawling i crawled for a really long time before i walked and yeah, flipping my, like being on my back and flipping my legs over, kind of over someone's lower back so that their legs are going this way. And like if this is someone's torso and flipping my legs this way works really well. Um, I really like um, like laying on my back also and having someone like lift the lower half of me up, whether for like someone going down on me or for like penetrative sex is really cool. Having sex in my wheelchair is rad. That works in lots of ways. Sideways over the two wheels, over back, doing wheelies, doing different things. Great. Love it. In Lauren's case, both of us are a little larger. Um, for an able-bodied person, that may not be such a big deal because your hips move, but because of her specific disability, her hips don't move and they don't flex quite as wide, for example, as mine do. So when you're thinking about, this is a vibrator, what am I gonna do with it? Norm, like your, your average able-bodied person doesn't have an issue with that, even if they're, they're heavy. Um, but when your hips don't move and you have to you know, figure out how you're gonna use something like that, um, you, have to, you have to adapt adapt it a lot. So what we learned is, for example, the longer it is, the better it works. We learned that she can't do anything that um, requires her legs to be elevated for too long um, because of her circulation. So, you know, in, in cases where, you know, we're doing something that's a little, a little kinky or whatever, and we're trying to, you know, tie her up, tie her down, um, you have to think hard about where am I going to put the knot in the rope so that it's not causing swelling or other problems that would cut off her circulation. Um, there was one case where we actually ended up getting a separate piece of furniture like that was inflatable um, so that she could put it under her hips so that she could lay on her stomach and it would work out all right. Um, stuff like that. One well, of the things about having a disability is that you, you can't have the normal, you know, it just happens.
thing. You have to talk through every little thing. A relationship began to bloom, that we enjoyed being with each other, that we got to a place of, um, of acknowledging mutual attraction to each other. And she was the first woman that I found that I could trust, who was really willing to go there with me to find out what my body was capable of and what would work and what I could do that could please her. And once I got over that boundary, that was huge. It became more and more about just me and my personal growth as an individual in a relationship and less and less about my body and my disability. She changed my mindset on disability and, and sexual orientation and all of that stuff so drastically that I don't think, I mean, I'm not even sure the word love is necessarily a, appropriate. I don't think there will ever be a time when I don't love her and when I don't feel like she's part of my family and don't want her around um, in that, you know, sense that this is somebody who's part of my, my life and who has changed me, I, I hope, for the better forever. I think that, I don't know, like, the only way that I've been able to, like, come to those conclusions and feel better about the way that I'm having sex and problem solving is by having good partners. And that took a really long time, you know, when you're, when you're rushing to just, like, find anyone to have sex with in order to like, you know, either just relieve an urge or feel good about yourself. All the re there's so many reasons why you want to just rush off and have sex. I get it. I understand. You're you're also resolving yourself to like having not as good experiences because for me so much of sex has to do with communication and has to do with like um, being able to say what you want and what you don't want and be able to take the time to say like my body does this it doesn't do this well I want to try that I would love to have sex upside down but that means you're gonna have to like hold my legs up while I hang there and stuff and I've done lots of cool stuff now you know but it's because like I was with one person for a while and we experimented and communicated and there were a lot of things I thought that I couldn't do that I that I can do with help. You know, like, to me, I was like, oh, it's a good thing, you know, I had that relationship with you. Right. Because, you know, we're a good match and all. And then as I've gotten older, it's like, you know what, actually, that's, that's really what sex should be like for everybody. <laughs> you know, that shouldn't just be a disability thing, is that you're, you know, listen to each other a lot and try new things and figure out, you know, go along the way. I think... Prior to becoming um, sexually active, I had a lot more issues of self-confidence than I do now. Um, I still have lots of them. I, my issues are a big knot of, like, string. <laughs> and you pull it one, and the rest of the issues get tighter. And then you pull it another, and the rest of the issues get tighter, including the one that you just loosened. Um, you know, I, I still have lots of self-confidence issues. However, um, just the fact that I was able to have this loving relationship and, and essentially a family with someone, um, I, I feel like during that time I felt like I was worthy of, of experiencing that. Um, you know, and since we've split, I have had somewhat of a relapse in terms of going back to feeling like, you know, well, just a cripple. Like, who's going to want me? We have to, you know, put aside the, the image that we have in our mind of like the perfect type if you start to say oh I only like this type um I only go for that type you're you you, you limiting yourself um and 
whom you could and oh, what? to me disability is frequently a self-identified thing and i you know would want it to be a self-identified thing but i don't think that people tend to i don't think that non-disabled folks tend to think of it as something you would ever want to identify yourself as which is really interesting Whereas, like, sexual orientation, gender, race are all considered things that, like, you would want to assert and, like, be proud of and have be a part of your daily life and daily existence and daily interaction. Whereas, like, a disability is something you want to, like, minimize as much as possible because it's a problem. It's not hot. It's not sexy. You can't dress it up. You can't look cute with it. You can't do, you can't dance with it. But you can. Like, you can do all of those things. To me, the whole relationship was always defined by um, the fact that I thought that it was really unfair and uncool that she had all of this sort of neurosis about the fact that nobody would want to be with her, which to me was just ridiculous be because I didn't associate the disability with the relationship. And it was because, you know, who she was as a person trumped, you know, appearance or disability or any of those other things. Did you know what your mouth would be good for? Oh god. Because you got a big mouth. Heard, no, it's not it's not about the size. It's not about the size. It's his head, it's you know. Oh, it's the head. Yeah. So how does that work? When you I So you're it saying because his head it. because of his cerebral palsy. Yeah, uh -huh. his head moves. Yeah, no, all you have to what do happens? is all you have to do is wait till he goes down on you and then you say, Hey Alex and he'll go and it'll work out real well. <laughs>